Time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley are here. A little preview of what we expect next week as they announce the next version of Windows. Paul and Mary Jo will be out here for that briefing and cover it specially next week on Windows Weekly. We'll also find out what you don't have to panic about Windows 7 and the end of life. It's, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therod and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 381, recorded September 24th, 2014. Wireless Wires. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Citrix ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with Citrix ShareFile. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter Windows. And by... Lynda.com. Lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. Instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on business, software, web development, graphic design, and more. For a free trial, visit lynda.com slash windows. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash windows. And by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where uh, we talk about Windows Weekly. And here we are with Mary Jo Foley of AllAboutMicrosoft.com, the fabulous ZDNet blog. She's back in her home office, ready and raring to go because... Well, we'll tell you why in a second. And also, Paul Therat is here. He is the uh, editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows, winsupersite.com, author of many books about Windows, most lately uh, Windows 8.1, the field guy in the Windows phone book. And he's been, he's been scribble, 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 as they say, writing away. <laughs> and on uh, all, all of it for naught because here comes Windows 9. Hello, Paul. Leo. Hello, Mary Jo. You know what? The most beautiful thing about Windows 9 for me is that 90% of what I've written is going to apply very nicely it's, to this release. So. Is is it fa safe to say that this is the Windows 7 to Windows 8's Vista? Yes. This is yeah. pretty much what we're talking about. When, in other words, under the hood, simil very, very similar. It's cosmetic. Oh, well, <clears throat> it, for what we know is so far, right? Right. There might be some right. things we don't right. know under right. the hood. Right, right, right. Although, by the way, I, I, you I know, it's, no, it's like, notable, isn't it? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's like a rescue, just like... Windows rescue. <laughs> An emotional rescue. Help just, is on the way, way, Windows 8. Here, here it comes. <laughs> Usually, though, with a with a new platform, they talk to developers first, right? Um, yeah. I think well, it's telling what, that this time... Isn't that the, what this is, though? Mm -mm. No, this is for businesses, right? Oh. These are enterprise features. Oh. And, um, you know, that's very telling because, I, well, on the one hand, it suggests, it doesn't prove, but suggests there isn't a big new platform thing happening. Because if you think about it, if you write Metro apps or whatever... Now they run in Windows. You don't have to do anything to support that stuff. It's fine. All the share contract stuff works as before um, from your perspective. But, you know, the audience base that they really screwed over with Windows 8 was, well, was everybody. But, you know, was, uh, <laughs> was you know, businesses primarily. So, you know, it makes sense that they would start with it, you know, try to win back those guys. So tell us, tell, uh, you know, we're starting kind of in the middle. Uh, tell us, yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of our audience already knows because we've been talking. Got, got Spoiler knows. alert, Leo. <laughs> we've been talking <laughs> this about This one it. ends badly. You're coming out uh, mm -hmm. next week on Tuesday because mm -hmm. Microsoft has an event September 30th. By the way, um, we are going to flip-flop Windows Weekly and Security now so that we can cover it in a timely fashion. So your right. briefing is Tuesday morning, and as soon as it's over, you're going to drive up here and we'll do a yep. special edition of Windows Weekly, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 2000 UTC on September 30th. That's a Tuesday. Yeah, and Leo, if you could look at at the globe of the Earth, and you could you could say, well, we're going to be on this side of it uh, to go to Petaluma. Would, would it be fair to say that you are on the exact opposite side of that globe on that day? Uh, yes, because <laughs> I'll be in London. <laughs> Yeah. For some reason. I'm flying to London on Sunday. Well, it's just, I have to take a vacation once in a while. And so it just sure. happens. That's the one I'm taking. 
Uh, so once again, uh, when you're in studio, I think I've only been here once when you guys have been <laughs> yeah. in studio. But uh, hey, we got. Fun. I'm not actually positive you even work there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You've never seen me in the I mean, this room together. that you're in looks a lot like that cottage thing from many years yeah. ago. As far as I know, you're just, yeah. this is just like a pirate it's, radio It's thing. all made up. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, you know, if, if people could, if, if, that, if that's even doable, like you could have a massive hoax like that, like for instance, yeah. that I'm anywhere but, you know, the brick house. Mm -hmm. right. um, it'd be fun. Maybe when I, when I get a little older, I'll try to pull something like that off. <laughs> I'll have to think about it. Anyway, I won't be here, but uh, we have the great father, Robert Ballasar, and, and he's a Windows fanatic, so he'll be here for you. What happened? That's a little bright in here. I'm Paul got that. up and Mary Jo disappeared. What? Have, I'm like a tiny speck. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like... It's like the Air France you strike. You are just, just walking gonna, out on me. You're just going to walk are out on me. Are you on strike? I should have said that we're doing well. I'll, I'll pay you more, honest. <laughs> What happened? Okay, we're going to fix Mary Jo. I don't know. Did you freeze? Yeah. I don't know. All right. That's Maybe our right. engineers just decided this would be the good time to mess with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's time for Mini Jo. Tell us about <laughs> what's a special little happening. version of Mary. Did you get an invitation? Is it yeah. is it a big press event? What's going on next week? Yeah, so um, here's what we know. It's, it's going to be one hour only. Oh, that's really uh, it, quick. It's going to be... I know. It's going to be presided over by Terry Myerson, who runs the operating system group, and Joe Belfiore, who, I, you know, I don't know what his title is now, Paul. Do you? Yes, he, he's on the Windows team, but. Right. He's probably you know. like Windows user experience or something. I think something like that. And it's a fairly small event from what we hear, like um, probably 50 invited guests or so, uh, press and analysts. And they're going to show us some of the features that are in Threshold. Uh, mostly the ones that are of interest to business customers. They're going to show us what we're calling the, and what they're calling the Windows Enterprise Technical Preview, which we think is going to come out sometime after that event, but we're not totally sure okay. on that. So that's important that you will not be getting any software on Tuesday. So let, let's frame this a little more clearly. Approximately 11 and a half hours in the air. <laughs> no build. <laughs> <laughs> right? right, two nights in an incredibly fun. expensive hotel in in, in San Francisco, <laughs> which yeah. I fully intended to be robbed. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna have a one hour meeting. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. what's well, it called? Yeah. A briefing. It's well, uh, you know, brief. The, the the other thing that makes this complicated for us is we only found out recently that we were invited, and it's the exact same time as Oracle Open World and Java World. Um, so the yeah. entire city of San Francisco is sold out because that show is so huge. So we've, I'm, we've I'm staying with scrambling. a gentleman who has a <laughs> shopping cart and some cardboard, and it's uh, I think it's like the entryway to a bank or something. Nice. And so I'll just be out there with my laptop and a little jar for money, <laughs> and that's going to be my yeah. San Francisco experience. But we're not complaining, everybody. We want yeah, to really. go to this. You get to well, go. no, well, actually, actually, so I mean, to, it's great. That's we true, get to by go. the way. We're not complaining. Yeah. So Mary Jo, I think we we're in Vegas. You know, she said. Or maybe it's before we went to Vegas. I don't remember exactly. But she said, you know, are we really going to travel all the way across the country to go to a one-hour meeting? And I said, yeah, we are. And she said, yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> just check it. You know, like, Am I like, yeah, no, I, I know we are. I mean, I just, you know, okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. 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 So that's, that's what's going to happen on the 30th. And then we're going to come up to Windows Weekly and tell you guys everything that happened in that one hour. Good. I can't wait. So we'll get our bri our briefing after you get your briefing. Yeah. Ours will be more than one hour, though. It will. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have other stuff to talk about. I'm sure. <laughs> that should be a lot of. I'm sorry, my Moto X is talking. Shh. <laughs> I'm working. Uh, we have a caller from Duluth. <laughs> Hello, Duluth. <laughs> Um, so we're gonna what? But now, and what do we expect? What I mean, uh, I mean, do well. First of all, Microsoft's told you not what has not told you anything, right? Or what? What did not they officially, say? Leo? Ah. But, <laughs> but what ah. I've heard on the down low, yeah. No, um, you know, I, we, we've certainly heard things. Um, I, I think most of what we're gonna see, and, and not necessarily all, but I think most of what we're gonna see is what's leaked. You know, it's the desktop stuff. It's the modern apps running in Windows. It's the new start menu. Um, but I think uh, the, the more important bit in some ways is going to be when we actually get to play with it. And, um, you know, I want to install it on tablets. I want to install it on real PCs. I want to see how it changes, you know, how different it really is from Windows 8.1. Um, and so, you know, they'll, they'll address some of that stuff. But 
and I'm not saying there aren't any surprises. I mean, how would I know? But um, yeah, I think we've seen a lot of it. A yeah. lot of yeah. what we're going to see. I mean, the, I think the invitation wording is very telling. It's here's all it says. Join us to hear about what's next for Windows and the enterprise. That's all it says. It doesn't say threshold. Doesn't say Windows nine. No right. clue about that. But we're we're like I'd say a hundred percent sure it's threshold that we're going to see there. Oh yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. It's very <laughs> yes. I mean, the the Windows technical preview is a, is a thing. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, has anybody seen the bits yet? I mean, I know that wouldn't be uh, they've not um, released them, but is any you know? Yeah, not in person, but uh, I've gotten some pretty good oh, okay. stuff, and I, I think okay. more of that's going to happen before right. the event, uh, not just to me, but um, yeah. You know, yeah there there are builds of this out there right now that. May That's not be right. the exact one that they distribute, but there are partner builds that they send out to partners. And as soon as they do that, no matter what, it leaks. And so there have been some leaked bits, but I think they're pre-technical preview, just just a little bit early, right? So, yeah. It's mostly what we have heard, though. We've been talking about this forever. It feels like the start menu comes back in a new form, but yeah. it, it comes back, right? Charms so are still How are they going to fit all there? of our questions into one hour? I know, you know? I know. Well, you know, I, I don't think they gonna, should just come up and say, look, they we may don't not have take questions. You. They may not take questions. They're not, questions. I bet. I, I bet, bet they don't. Gonna. <laughs> Why would they? It's like, blah, brain dump. Here's here's everything we're going to tell you guys. Here you go. Okay, bye. That's it. It's such a <laughs> short amount of time. It's really about positioning, yeah. isn't it? It is. It's and to you know, get they, you to go along. They want us to tell business users, hey, guys, there's hope. This is going to be more what you wanted and expected, and it's looking good so far. I think that's kind of the the hope. I think, that, and by the way, I, to be fair, I think they're going to be able to deliver that message pretty Me credibly. Same. Yeah, because uh, you know, the, I think the key here is something. It's so interesting when you think about it this way. But if you really did buy into Windows eight, you know, you got into that and you use it on devices, whatever. I think that this upgrade is going to make plenty of sense to you. It's not going to be foreign or weird or different again. But if you're coming from Windows 7, I think the same thing is also true. You know, unlike Windows 8, this will be a familiar upgrade. And that's, you know, I mean, this is like a hole they dug themselves, but it's a fairly interesting accomplishment if it works out that way. That's interesting. You know, the, so you don't think somebody coming from Windows 7 will feel it all at sea? It won't look no, that No, because different. if you're running Windows 7 on a regular PC and you upgrade to this, it's going to look like Windows 7. I mean, you'll have some new stuff in the start menu, but oh, that's it's interesting. arguably an upgrade of the start menu. And the experience will be Windows on a desktop and a taskbar, and it's very... Oh, that's interesting. It looks a lot like Windows 7. Yeah. Um, if you're running it on a Surface, um, presumably a tablet, you know, you're going to have a, uh, a start screen, and you're going to have the charms and the touch, you know, edge interfaces and all that stuff. And... That will make sense to you because that's what you've been doing. Um, and, of course, the other big change from Windows 8 is that if you don't want any of that stuff or you want it to be different, you can modify it, which was something that wasn't possible, mm -hmm. especially in the initial release of Windows 8. So it's cool. Yeah. This is big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a big – that's that's actually great. That's kind of kind – of, why didn't they <laughs> do that? Long? Yeah, I just, just – yeah. it There's sounds so like reasons. common sense. I mean <laughs> – no, you know what? A lot of this is cart horse stuff or chicken egg stuff. You know, um, yeah. you know, Windows RT is something that might make sense a few years down the road. Why didn't they wait? You know, that right, kind of thing. Right, right. Why didn't they wait to release this, um, you know, Win RT environment until they had the ability to integrate it better with the desktop and run yeah. it in floating Windows and have it make sense for everybody? Um, you know, we can do the Y game, you know, all day long. It's hard to say. I mean, sometimes you just got to ship and iterate and get it out there in the world and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I... Probably would have chosen to do this differently. I think some other people might have as well, but um, they didn't. Yeah. I saw, <laughs> so. I saw Dr. Dr. Pizza said a, an interesting thing about this on Twitter. He said, you know what? This should have been the first release, the one that we're about to get. And then, yeah, and then they, down get, the line, exactly. they should have done that's Windows exactly. 8. Right? Yep. <laughs> that's exactly what I was saying. Yep. Yeah. Right. It should have just but, been reversed. They didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. They didn't. Yeah. But they didn't. Well, I think I, I don't think the Titanic nature of this new environment would have hit home, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. By 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 enforcing the notion that because it is uh, a separate thing from the desktop, you know, by making it a mobile environment, um, by giving you the possibility that in the future the desktop goes away on certain classes of devices, you know, you have this thing that is something new. It's it is by nature a new platform, you know. Um, if we just had a new kind of app, you know, Metro applications and floating windows, people would have said, well, 
we have WPF. I don't understand. What does this give you exactly? Like, what is this? We already have .NET. We already have a new runtime. We have a sandbox. Why? You know, what was the point of this? Um, you know, you can't. I, I. They should have, but it wouldn't. They couldn't have done that in the three years that it took to make Windows eight. Yeah. You know. No, that makes sense. Uh, I guess well, it's. It, I don't make sense as a tough one, but it, <laughs> it, it, it is what they did. It is. I mean, what it, it, it's what happened. You know, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So yeah, we'll be there, and maybe mm. there'll be some surprises. Who knows? Maybe I think there'll they be will. some under the cover stuff that we haven't heard about. Maybe I don't know if they're going to talk APIs and all that. I would think not because they're talking about this as a an enterprise I, I, thing way, and not a developer thing. If I were going to bet between there being any meaningful new APIs and there not being, I would bet on not. I, I mm. actually think they can do everything they need to do without changing the developer story okay. at all. I mean. WinRT should be iterated and new features added and all that kind of stuff. But this is not right. major retelling of the platform. I mean, they're just, they're doing the work they need to do to let those applications run mm -hmm. in this new environment, you know, a different environment. That doesn't require right. developers to do anything. Right. And, if and anything, we're not going to see, we're, we're not going to see that combined um, phone arm, Windows on yeah. arm skew. Yeah, because that's more of a consumer thing. Story, I right. guess. Right. And that's where if there are changes at the API level, I would think that's where you would That's care a different and, that's a different story. You know, yep. Yep. Right. That's true. Yeah, this is gonna be the dust we think the desktop skew. So the the one that's for Intel, the one that still has the desktop in it, oh. because we think the one that's gonna be on ARM doesn't even have a desktop huh. anymore. If huh. you think about um, the improvements they made in eight one and then in the eight one update. A lot of that was around uh, making it better for desktop users, you know, mouse, mm -hmm. keyboard, that kind of thing. If you look at the 9.0 stuff, you know, the tech preview stuff, it's the same. It's A2, right? It's We're extending that notion. Now, we're going to bring these Metro apps that people on a 27-inch screen would never run. Would, I'm never going to sit here with the weather app up on my screen and observe the weather or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. use Xbox video or something. Like, that's ridiculous. I, this is a, a complex desktop environment. I want to have multiple windows and things. Um, by making those applications run there, you know, now that kind of stuff starts to make sense. Because I can have weather in a little thin thing over, in, you know, floating in the corner behind other stuff, and I can look at it occasionally. It doesn't get in the way of everything. And so I think, there's a, I, I think this alone will uh, jumpstart adoption of those kinds of apps. And actually, if I could find this thing, I just came up, I just, uh, you know, Microsoft has a... Um, Microsoft by the numbers site, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was just looking at this the other day. <clears throat> there are some interesting stats for apps. Um, Windows Store has 155,000 apps. That's the Windows 8 store. But the Windows Phone Store has over 300,000 apps. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, what is it? Um, the Windows Phone Store has had over, four, I'm sorry, let's see the two or four. Sorry, I've got it. I, I, I took the quote out and I'm, I'm not sure which is real. Let's say 2 billion. I'm not really positive. 2 billion downloads of apps and games. The Windows Store has 250 million. It's one eighth the size, wow. you know, of uh, the number of downloads. This is People, a great site, you know, by the way. I really, yeah. This is really fun. There's, yeah. So, given the choice, in something. other words, on Windows Phone, if you want to run apps, you go to the Windows Phone Store. You don't have a choice. On the Windows Desktop, you have a choice. And overwhelmingly, people are choosing not to use the Windows Store. They're just getting apps the way they always yeah, did on the web. Yeah. And um, I, I think that this stuff we're seeing in Threshold will make the Windows Store more, more attractive because it's now it's apps that will run for everybody. Because I think a lot of desktop users look at the store and they're like, yeah, this is cute. Back to Photoshop, yeah. <laughs> you know, or whatever they're using. <laughs> well, that does say something about the success of Metro on the desktop, right? Yeah. I mean, if it's well, half, so far, the, half I mean, as many apps, I mean, partly that means developers aren't jumping on it, but I think developers would jump on it if they felt like there was a market. Yeah, it, it's d definitely a chicken egg thing. But, chicken you know, egg, yeah. there are 1.5 billion people using Windows every day. Yeah, yeah that's only why tiny, I'm surprised. Yeah. But there's only a tiny percentage of those using these apps, and there's only a, a, a minority percentage of those people using Windows 8. Yeah. Right? Um, so mm -hmm. it's interesting how much better the numbers are for Windows Phone. When it comes to the app stores, yeah, yeah, much better. And um, it, yes, I know that's the Windows. So counterintuitive. Well. I would not have guessed that. <laughs> I know right. it is kind of counterintuitive, uh, but you know, they we think that with Threshold, they're going to have the stores combined. 
right? At, right. at some point when they before they release the final form. Right. So there will only be one store for Windows Phone and Windows, we think, when Threshold comes out, which would be great. And, you know, uh, there are uh, Windows Phone apps that are awesome that would be great, even on a desktop, if you could run them in a floating window. Uh, and more to the point, there are many, many Windows Phone games that are fantastic that would be great on the tablet. Um, what's the difference between a 1366 tablet and a 1080p phone? You know, those uh, those uh, games would run wonderfully on a tablet. Yeah. So well, we'll see what happens yeah. there. But well, I think that can be Speaking of counterintuitive, <laughs> what is the most popular Windows 8 device? <laughs> Yeah, this one, I you know, it's funny because I had written about this in the past. You know, the, the ad duplex guys do usage analysis on Windows Phone every single month, and I always publish information about the data they come up with. And then twice a year, they do it for Windows 8 devices. And, um, <laughs> you know, this is one of those things, I sort of read this, and I thought, this can't, what? <laughs> like, am I reading this right? But when you look at just usage, um, Microsoft Surface devices, like, I mean, they don't dominate the market because the Windows market, of course, is uh, fragmented. fragmented with yeah. hundreds and hundreds of yeah. devices. But the most popular Windows 8, that's Windows 8 devices, right? Not just straight PC. Like, this doesn't include Windows 7 PCs. Yeah. Uh, but Windows 8 devices in use. Surface RT. <laughs> what? Like the original, the original Surface what? RT. What is this? Where does this measurement come from again? I know Ad Duplex, right? So Ad Duplex puts, uh, you know, as an ad uh, network, right? So if you have yeah. ads that are on this network, they can gauge, they can look at and see what the device type is. So it's a sampling, so this is a but it's statistically significant. It's a sampling, yeah. It's yeah. you know, yeah. hundreds of devices or whatever. But wow, um, it, it's, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, and again, uh, I, I would imagine that we're talking. I actually don't know this for a fact, but I would imagine these are metro apps, like um, because they do Windows yeah. Phone, and so it's probably that environment or whatever. And so oh, within the well, that's different. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, but still, you know, the first generation RT for that one to be the biggest <laughs> and the biggest by far, by the way, um, nine point eight two percent, almost ten percent of all like metro app usage, if that's what this is, is on the first version of Surface RT. It's no wonder people hate this thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> that's the only one I have. Actually, that's the only one I have come to think of it. But, you know, the Surface devices combined, you know, Surface RT is number one. Surface 2, which is an RT device, is number two. Those two devices combined uh, is whatever that is, 12%, over 12%. Um, add in all the Surface Pro devices, 15%. 15% of all this stuff is Microsoft devices. Yeah, that's but really if you interesting. Think about it. I mean, if you're if you're on a a Windows RT device, you mm -hmm. have to use Metro apps. Like you don't. I mean, you you have Office that isn't. Yeah. Yes, that, no, that's almost 100 percent okay. of your usage will be Metro. Right. Sure. So yeah. th I think that's why that's skewing it a little. Maybe, don't you? Yeah, and you see, you know, if you look at the um, the Asus Transformer Book T100, and I think it's in fourth place, and mm -hmm. that's the the one big third party tablet two in one type device. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it's RT though, right? Isn't that a, um, I think that's I can't remember a, if that is. Safe device, I'm not really sure. But it's, uh, it, that one I know is popular. People ask me about that one a lot. Um, the other one you see in there, it's not in the top 10, but down at the very bottom is the Dell Venue 11 Pro. That's the full-size version of the Dell tablet 2-in-1, which, which is a great machine, actually. And that's Windows 8. Uh, that's Windows 8. Yeah. And then the Dell uh, Venue 8 Pro, which is, of course, the mini tablet version is up there around number 10 or uh, wherever that is in the top. Um, you know, so I've used some of these. I've used a lot. Actually, I guess it's fair to say I've used over 50% of these devices in the top 10 anyway. But, um, it, it, you know, <laughs> it is, it's a weird little mix of stuff. I mean, you see traditional PCs in there, I think. I'm sure if you looked up an HP Pavilion 15, it's just a big, goofy 15-inch <laughs> laptop that's probably really cheap. Um, so some most of these devices. are Windows 8 devices. They're not all. They're not all yeah. uh, RT devices. They're not all. Oh yeah, no. Most of them. Are, most of them are Windows 8 devices. Yeah. What's other? Seventy-three percent other. What is that? Is that just like tiny? Those are tiny probably slices? a slice of uh, yeah. This like sub you know zero point one percent whatever. Uh, there's a lot. Seventy-three percent other, which just shows the diversity of the market, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. If you were to look at the Windows Phone 8 device usage, what the uh, the biggest chunk, ninety-five percent, would be Nokia. Right, mm. of course. No, I mean literally. It's literally last month. Literally was ninety five. Well, that doesn't. Does it, are you surprised by that? 
No, but you, it, it's a completely different kind of market. Oh, I see. Yeah. And obviously the... Um, Microsoft uh, owns Nokia, so it's not... Yeah, know. well, right, but they didn't always, obviously. But right. the um, that market's going to change, hopefully, for the better in the sense that we're going to see more diversity there. We've got all these new companies coming online. And hopefully over the next several months, we'll see some, you know, because you don't really, you know, you don't want the house brand with like 95% of no. The, no. the usage. Yeah. I mean, as much as you do want it to be successful, that's not a very healthy ecosystem. Well, that's a, I don't, that's <laughs> an interesting stat you pulled I know, it's, it's weird. There's, there's no, I mean, yeah. right. It's hard to look at this you and could not win be a bar bit with that one if anybody knew yeah. what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. you could. Um, so we talked ye uh, last week about the Billy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, yes, the yes, Billy. Leo. Yes, Billy. <laughs> Which, for those who haven't been listening assiduously, is a low-end, very inexpensive Windows phone yeah. sold in uh, developing nations. Blue has a couple of those, too. And, uh, have you looked at these, the Blue Win Junior and the Blue Yeah, Wind they sent me their two devices this week. And, are they and these are very for interesting. our market or for... Yeah, you're gonna uh, you can buy the junior right now on on Amazon, and the the Win HD will be available, I think, within the week or two. Inexpensive, I would guess. Very inexpensive, and these are the typical kinds of devices that exist now because Microsoft opened up the licensing, both by making it free or zero dollars, but also by uh, reducing kind of uh, loosening the reins on the requirements and allowing Android device makers to come over and and more easily port their designs over. And uh, these two are, are representative, I think, of what we're going to see. And so the, the Blue Wind Junior is a very low-end device. It, it competes with the Lumia 530. Uh, low-end specs across the board, you know, it's like four gigs of RAM, uh, four, I'm sorry, four gigs of internal storage. It's got micro SD, dual-core processor, um, you know, really low-res screen, um, not super high-quality screen. It does have a flash, though. It's interesting um, eventually, the, whatever comparison I'm able to come up with, it is interesting to compare it to the Nokia, you know, the relevant Nokia device. So there's some pluses, some minuses. Um, but the big plus here is the same plus we always talk about in the PC market, which is just kind of the value of it. And I guess the, the question is going to be whether these things fall out on the cheap side of the equation or the value side of the equation. And um, so I'll be looking at that. And then the, the more interesting device, though, I think, is the Blue Win HD. And um, this one, when, when you see a picture of it, you think, wow, this is like a... It looks like an HTC M, like one, the original one. Um, that device, of course, was aluminum or some kind of metal. These are actually plastic. Um, but that in its own way is kind of neat because they're really thin and light and they are colorful. So they come in these neon colors in both these devices too. And I think they have yellow and orange and um, pink and then a matte white as well. And you can pop the back off on both of these devices, so meaning you can get to the battery, which is actually really important to a lot of people. Micro SD slot is in there. And also, they both have dual SIMs, which is something that is very unusual in the United States. In fact, I think until, I don't think we have any Windows Phone devices with dual SIM capabilities in the United States outside of these two phones. I could be wrong about that, but I don't believe so. They're the first I've seen. And that's something that's important to international markets, especially China. But um, I'm starting to hear from people who are saying, well, you know, that would be great for people who travel all the time or that would actually, you know, be great for certain, you know, uh, situations where you have a work phone and you have a home phone and they, you know, works paying for this con connectivity, but not for this connectivity. And if you could have both of those things in one phone, I mean, why not? And I, I, I'm not actually sure I'm going to ever test this, but um, I'm sort of intrigued by that notion as well. Um, but the, you know, the Blue Win Junior is sort of nondescript. Um, the Win HD is really, it's actually a really pretty device. In fact, I could show it to you. I got the yellow. Oh, it's actually, I guess it's technically green, but it looks Wait a minute, shouldn't it be blue? No, it's well blue. <laughs> it comes in different colors. That's confusing. Um, no, it's an See, eight, it looks pretty. Uh, That's a, that looks like a nice little phone, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it is, it's nice. And it's, it's a dual a, SIM it, with a radio, that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. Cheap. Cheap. This and is, no contract. You know, they're sold no contract. Right. This is what uh, developing nations... Uh, this is very typical of developing nation phones of any stripe. Well, I mean, uh, you know, if you're into downsizing and you want to live in a tiny home and you want to pay no, you know, cable bill every month and, you know, whatever, you could live in the United States and want this kind of phone too. I mean, yeah. not everyone can afford a, an $850 iPhone 6. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's not comparable to the iPhone 6, don't get me wrong. I mean, these are completely different kinds of products, but um, it's nice to have, 
I think this one's going to fall on the value side of that equation, I guess is what I'm saying. It is inexpensive, but I don't think it's, it's not like cheap. Like I don't, I don't think anyone would feel awkward, you know, like sorry for my pathetic phone from the past, you know, like this is, it's nice. It's actually oh, a nice phone. Good. Yeah. Yeah. How does it compare to the low end Lumias, like the budget Lumias? So this one, I think it's hard to say exactly where this lines up because the odd, the, there's some odd speckage to this one as well. Like, so this one has eight gigabytes of storage in micro SD, but it also has the same low end processor as the other wind device, which is kind of strange because it's competing against devices that have quad core processors. So, you know, Windows Phone is very efficient and I, that's one of those things you're going to have to test. But I think this is going to fall between somewhere in the 635, like for Lumia's, uh, 635, 730, 830, somewhere in that range. I, I need to figure out exactly where it lines up. Um, but again, not super expensive. I think it's going to be the $150 range, mm -hmm. no contract, you know, certainly under $200. Which is, you know, crazy. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy pricing. You know, like a well, it's not, but that's still Nexus expensive. Five is three hundred. Yeah, but that's still pricey in terms of. Uh, but that's no know. contract, and so. Yeah, but I mean, there's ninety dollar, ninety five dollar Windows phones, aren't there? Oh of, no, of course there are. But I mean, um, you know, when you get something like a like the Win Junior or a Lumia five thirty, I mean, these are really low end devices. I mean, they're not. They're, those aren't great. You know. So this uh, is 635. This is, is about 99. This yeah. is better. Okay. This is definitely better. Oh, I mean, this is, right. um, and it's just a, it's nice looking. It's actually really attractive. Yeah. Does it have Horween leather? No. <laughs> no, it has yellow plastic. Look, <laughs> it's unabashedly as Apple is learning. Yellow. As Apple is learning, plastic <laughs> is actually the best thing for a phone. Yeah, the antennas yeah. work. You can't bend it. It's hard to break. It's yeah. inexpensive. It can be made very nicely. I think that uh, the Lumia phones are a great example of that, frankly. I know. I know. Plastic. Yeah. Uh, moving on, I guess, unless you want to talk more about those. I think I beat that one to death. Angst. <laughs> angst in the Windows camp as iPhone 6. Actually, that, <sighs> I could tell you wrote that before this morning. At this point. Thanks to ben, uh, no. bending uh, phones yeah. and an update yeah. that bricked many other many phones, uh, nobody's envying Apple today. Uh, well, they still sold ten million of those puppies over the weekend, well, so you know whatever. More and people I, I, were I, pissed off. That's all that means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I don't know if uh, Mary Jo doesn't cover this kind of stuff. She, she probably doesn't uh, get this kind of uh, negative reaction. But you know, every once in a while, an important something will happen. That's not Microsoft, and right. so I write about it. And then I, you start hearing from people who are like, they're just freaking out. Right. And um, I, I sort of felt the need to be like, guys, you know, like, um, just chill. <laughs> and it, it's important, so I have to write about it. Right. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, don't yeah. worry, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not switching out. Apple or anything. Like I mean, 10 million phones <laughs> is a record number uh, for yeah. any company in three days. Um, yeah. so even a record for Apple. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, that's it's something to look at and admire. There's a lot of stories there. I mean, uh, that number would have been higher if China had been online like they were supposed yeah, to be. And yeah. I think China is doing the same thing uh, to Apple with the iPhone that they're doing to Microsoft with the Xbox One, which is like, uh, screw you, L pay attention. We're yeah. here, and yeah. you know, we're gonna, we are gonna mess with you because we are the biggest market on earth, and you need to start understanding that we're gonna make arbitrary rules, and you're gonna have to abide by them. <laughs> you know, and it's interesting. The China thing is very interesting to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, ten million in one in three days. I mean, I is that more than it. all the Windows phones combined so far? No, no, no. 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 Oh, they, they've had, they've had <laughs> they're at least they eleven million. Quarters. I'm sure. Oh, they've sold ten to fifteen million in quarters. They oh okay, they, all right. It's <laughs> okay. Not, no, it's, I want to put this not. in perspective. Okay, <laughs> it's hard to put it in perspective. I mean, I had you know when when. Um, uh, when Apple announced, I think it was 4 million pre-orders in the first 24 hours, I think I tweeted, I don't think I wrote a story about this, but I'm pretty sure I tweeted something to the effect of, I went back and looked at their previous quarter, Nokia's, and I said, that's uh, as many phones as Nokia sold in any given quarter, in uh, any given month in the first quarter of 2014, or the first half of 2014, yeah. something like that. Um, so, yeah, you know, this is... Uh, iOS is kind of losing the market share battle to Android, I guess. Um, but, you know, compared to Windows Phone, they're still much bigger. Much, much bigger. Yeah, they're doing all right. Um, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a decent little business. They should make a run. Really, where they're it. doing best is in marketing. I mean, this is, this is, these guys are masters of, of communication and marketing. Yeah. Are they not? Well, and, 
Yes, yep. uh, but you know, <laughs> so, well, no, they they are obviously, and so I think in the I think part of the problem with Apple is um, you have a, a perception which is often accurate, you know, of, of sort of arrogance, and uh, you know, there are people who don't like that kind of stuff. There are people who just don't like Apple, and like I get that. I mean, I I I've had to deal with the Apple fanboys a lot, so I, I understand that aspect of it. But as that platform has matured, and under Tim Cook, I think the most amazing bit is has that platform has opened up. Um, uh, you know, the the gaps are where they were are closing. And you got to remember the iPhone was already doing stuff uh, better than Windows Phone to begin with. And so I think it's interesting sometimes to look at these platforms and say, you know, um, that, yeah, I get it. You don't like Apple, but there are a list of things that this thing does really well that we do not have on Windows. And it's I think it's important to take note of that kind of stuff. And uh, and hopefully Microsoft responds by adding some of the more important stuff. You know, the stuff that we had first, and we, we did the wallet, we, you know, like I was part of it. I mean, Microsoft did the wallet, <laughs> we, you know, because I had a we. big part role to play in that. Um, <laughs> Microsoft did the wallet thing two years ago. Right. Um, nobody uses it. Nobody. Right. Like well, Google. to be fair, and, Google also did, and, and very few use it. So, Well, so Google actually had their wallet in 2011. It was even earlier. Yeah. Um, Microsoft improved on that. I mean, so Microsoft did this kind of superset of what, Apple at the time had with Playbook. Is that what it's called? Play, no. Playbook. Uh, pa now you've uh, got Passbook. Passbook, yeah. Passbook. Right. Um, so th they created a, a super set of Passbook and Google's own wallet with that one sort of problem, which is nobody uses it. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if the capabilities are in the OS if they're not provided to users. Um, and so it's too bad. But I think Apple, with their market power, they're going to get that stuff out there. And uh, hopefully that benefits us. On the Windows yeah, well, that's what I think. I think this it's just it just further furthers the whole thing, and yeah, um, uh, you know, no merchant is going to do something that he can only sell to half the people who walk in the store at best. So, sure. uh, the, the, what we talked yeah, about, yeah, I think uh, this is going to unleash a tsunami of e-wallet stuff, and, I, and that's going to be good. I think the bottom line in the, in this is Apple timing is excellent. The 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 chip and pin requirement takes over in the United States in, at the end of 2015. That means merchant. in other words, all cards are required to have chip and pin. That means all merchants are going to have to upgrade their little pay terminals sure. between now and then. So Apple, knowing this, is saying, all right, good. Well, you guess what? what? Noticed, though. <laughs> We're going to be here. I mean, and so when you upgrade, you should get one. And, and no merchant's going to say, well, I'm going to get the uh, Apple Pay one only. The, all <laughs> these terminals will do them all. They'll do all NFC. Well, I mean, there's no, okay, so there's no such thing as an Apple Pay terminal, right? I mean, they're just using standard. Um, well, I don't. I don't know. I mean, well, I don't know. Well, no, they, they, they literally is true. It's just standard. And, and okay. You could walk into a, a McDonald's has these. Uh, Starbucks has them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lots of places have. Them. And you but can I don't use understand. your phone and just tap it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who, but who? I don't. Don't know do that, that with an iPhone. It'll bend. But you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't phone. hit it too hard. You know, you might put take a chunk out of it or something. <laughs> Um, <laughs> they do make it easy. They didn't sometimes. show that but, in the Apple video. That <laughs> right. No. You know what I found out today about the bending thing, by the way, is uh, I sort of assumed it happened only in the back because this is something I have observed out in the world. You know, well, iPhones you are so small. It, yeah. Well, people, you know, they would put them in their back pocket. This is not something I would ever do, but if you spend any time out in the world, you see people with iPhones in their back pockets all the time. And um, I think that, you know, they... They upgraded this new big phone, and they're just used to kind of slipping yeah. it in there, and they right. sit on it, it bends. I mean, okay. But um, actually, this is happening in people's front pockets yeah. as well. Yeah. And actually, to be fair, a front pocket is a much more common place to put a phone. And uh, I, I routinely put my Windows phones in there, including the large Windows phones. Um, and now I'm nervous about that because I have put the you iPhone 5 or 6 be Plus, whatever. Very in. afraid. <laughs> it's like putting a surfboard in your pocket. It makes it kind of hard to sit down, you know? It makes me glad I have a purse. Let's just say that. <laughs> well, you Especially might with be, that fifteen twenty. <laughs> yeah, I might even be vulnerable there. I don't know. Some writer I love this. I was he at CNET somewhere, likened the iPhone six plus to clown shoes. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, I'm sorry. No, but that, all that says is he's never used a, a well, that's right. before because notes have been that big for yeah, years, two years. What does that make the fifteen twenty? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's right. A clown I mean, that's car. what I mean. Like, so, like yeah. to me, going from a fifteen twenty to a iPhone is very natural size wise. Right. Um, what I'm worried about more is the people who are using that little iPhone 5 or 5S, probably 5, right? Or even a 4S. Imagine, like, it's like a little, looks like a stick of gum now. I know, it's so small. You know? I mean, they're like, they're going to be How are these things comparable? Yeah. I don't get this. They're going to be like giants and little. Yeah. I'm telling yeah. all, all the uh, 
uh, iPhone uh, buyers uh, to buy the little one because uh, it's nice and it's beautiful. It's a little it's bit too can... much, I think, of a leap to go yeah, to the big one. Yeah, it's really crazy. I'm not even happy with it. And I, and you know, as you know, I use big phones. Yeah, I cannot lie. Those other brothers can't deny. <laughs> phone one, walks one other in. thing we should mention yes. while we're on the topic of updates and all. While, while we started Windows Weekly, Microsoft started rolling out the update for the Windows Phone preview for developers ah, this afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, well, rolling out, this, what do you mean? You mean like an update, like not an, an update It's like just an updated that. version. Of right. So it's yeah. it's... Um, like bug fixes, performance enhancements. But if you are one of the people who's been stuck with an HTC 8X or 8S that would not update, you now can update. Um, oh, they're saying to Windows Phone 8.1 update. Um, okay. So this this is clearing out the path for some more people who are on the developer preview to get um, an update who could not before. No word for us on the icon. Sadly, <laughs> still. <Yeah. laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You on Verizon? No, you can't have that. Uh, yeah. So we don't even have Windows Phone 8.1 on the icon yet. Well, from, uh, well, from you know, uh, you could get it on the. You could get the developer. Preview. Preview. You, just, you couldn't right. get the firm. Yeah. You can't get the official, and you can't get Cyan. Yeah. Yeah. No word on that. Yeah. Well, I'm sure Verizon yeah, our, doesn't deliver updates to iPhone users either. Either. So what's the difference? Oh no! Yeah, these it's the carriers are absolutely the roadblocks. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I, yeah. Apple does have. To be fair, Apple has a little more clout with the uh, carriers. carriers. I'm amazed yeah. that none of these iPhones have any. This is a Verizon uh, iPhone. Doesn't have any branding. Doesn't have any Verizon apps at all on it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Apple has huge clout with these guys. I, you know, I that may be changing rapidly, but. Uh, for well, now. I think Apple's the one, you know, by the time it got to Verizon, um, it was obviously very popular. And you can only imagine their reaction, which was like, you know, listen, you don't have to sell it. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, this yeah. is so this is okay. the deal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. This you know, is how it comes. If you don't like it, no we're, problem. We're happy to send people yeah. to T-Mobile on 18th. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say the word. No problem. Yeah. Mm. Huge market clout. Yeah. That's amazing. <sighs> it's funny that Samsung doesn't wield the same clout. <laughs> Well, you know, but you know why they don't? Actually, yeah, that's they explainable. Don't care. Why? No, because Samsung doesn't sell a phone. They sell like a hundred phones. Right. So there is no one device where right. Samsung could say, "No, you have to do this," because right. their their sales are spread out over multiple devices. Right. And that's that's why. So it's like it's kind of like a side benefit of Apple's uh, strategy. I mean, I realize they have two devices now, but um, you know, it goes back to that single device or over several versions. They only had the one device and. Um, that you know, again, it. whatever we got. Even yeah. with two so devices, you know, I mean, that's that's a, yeah. you know, you yeah. No, I think that's... Well, it's not changing now. They're not going to go back to some system where you got to wait for the carrier to deliver updates or whatever, right. and you put Verizon logos on phones. That's It's never going back. No. So, no. yeah. Uh, all right. Let's see. Let's take a break. And uh, we're going to talk about wireless display adapters. Windows 7's life cycle clock is ticking. What? <laughs> Jeez. What? What? And a recap of round two of the Microsoft layoff game. It's all coming up as uh, we continue with Windows Weekly. Paul Theroux and Mary Jo Foley. Our show today brought to you by our good buddies at Citrix who make share files. Citrix share file for business, by business. It is the way to share files in business. And I'm a big fan. I know you probably know I use share file every day. Just used it yesterday. I'll be using it again today. Send audio to the radio stations. This is a particularly uh, unique challenge because the people I'm sharing these files with are not the most sophisticated users in the world. Um, you know, radio station engineers and continuity people. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Some of them know a little bit too much. They know enough to be dangerous. Citrix ShareFile is the solution. It eliminates the email attachment. That by itself would make me sing its praises. You know email attachments are vectors for viruses. They also are insecure. Anybody can read that attachment along the way. And bounce backs are becoming a problem as we send bigger and bigger files in business. You know, PowerPoint presentations and PDFs and spreadsheets are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. ShareFile works because you're not sending an attachment. Actually, if you use the Outlook plugin, it looks just like you are, but you're not. You're sending a, a link, a secure link that your uh, recipient can click. They'll see your branding 
I mean, it says share file in the lower corner, just a little. But they see, they see when they get it from me, it's they see twit. They see a big button that says download. They don't have to sign up for anything. They just click it, and it's there, and it works, and it's so easy for them. I uh, share file saved my life. I wanted to save yours. 30 days free. You also, it's also file sh file uh, syncing in the cloud. So I have a share file sync tool. Works Windows and Mac. It's you you have you say which folders are synchronized. They're synchronized with the cloud. That means I can use the mobile uh, share file app on my devices to access those files. I can download them, but I can also send them off. So if I go home uh, today without forgetting to send off the ads to the uh, radio stations, it's a simple enough thing. I just do it right on the phone. ShareFile is good in so many ways. If you're a, an attorney, we had an attorney call the radio station, said, I, I want to be able to get pictures of accidents from my clients who are, are suing. And I said, ShareFile, you can request files too. And it's it's just as easy going in the other direction for unsophisticated users. Citrix ShareFile, try it today for 30 days free. Visit ShareFile.com. Do me a favor, though, when you go to ShareFile, go to the very top of the page where it says Podcast Listeners. We have our own little button there. Click that one and enter the offer code Windows. That way, Paul and Mary Jo will get the benefit uh, of your listening, and you'll get 30 days free. Do customize it for your industry, too. ShareFire file is uh, compliant with regulations in many industries. SEC regulations in the financial industry. HIPAA requirements for medical. Sh ShareFile.com. Click the microphone. Enter Windows. You'll love it. Paul Therott, Mary, Joe Foley are here. We are talking Windows on Windows uh, Weekly. Moving on to item number two, wireless dongles. <laughs> and Mary Jo, of course, is the expert. Go ahead, Mary Jo. I am. Oh, yeah. Yes. I, I know all about this. The queen it, of it wireless dongles. Right. That's that's my uh, <laughs> no. separate business card title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is kind of a confusing story because it Microsoft was, had just it, it was billed as like them. a Chromecast kind of thing. It's is kind it? of yeah. So they came out with this <laughs> thing that is called the Microsoft Wireless Adapter. Okay. I think isn't that the official name? Or Great something? name. That makes me want yeah. to run to the store and buy it. Yep. Um, yeah, it's sixty bucks. It's going to be on sale next month in the U.S. and Canada through Microsoft stores and Best Buy. And so what this is, is, is very similar to the Chromecast. It's something you can use to connect your Miracast enabled device, both interestingly, both Windows 8.1 device or an Android device to something like a large screen monitor, an HDTV or a projector. And you can basically cast your screen on there, right? Um, now, I'm going to let Paul take over the next part because Microsoft had already just announced a wireless adapter. Um, and Paul was kind of all over that in his coverage. <laughs> that was for Windows Phone, I believe, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, it was a different lesson. So. Yeah. Less than 30 days ago, Microsoft announced a nearly identical device um, that <laughs> it's a, it, from a functional standpoint. With a different um, name, it looks though, different. a very confusing a, name. Yeah, different name. Um, Target markets are slightly different. Um, the other device, which costs twenty dollars more, it comes with an NFC link plate, meaning that if you have an NFC compatible device, you can tap it to that plate to make the connection, right? Um, to negotiate the connection, I guess. Um, which is still occurring over. Over what? I don't even know what it is. Wi-Fi, whatever the connection yeah, is. Yeah, Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi. Um, no, I'm not totally sure. Is this, how how yeah. is this different from DLNA, which is an industry standard for so this? So this is part of my tip, Leo. We're going to hold that part of the conversation right. off the end okay. because um, this thing looks like a Chromecast device. It actually has nothing to do with what Chromecast does. Oh, all right. Um, uh, beyond the fact that you have sort of a device on your lap and you've got something connected to your uh, TV and they look the same. But honestly, the, the technologies are completely different. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But from the perspective of a uh, consumer, I guess the deal is you've got a device, you've got something on it, it whether it's your screen, you know, you could do the whole screen or uh, some video content. You want to play a YouTube video or an Xbox video rented movie or whatever it may be. You want to put it up on the big screen. You know, these devices will, well, not all, they don't all work this way. The Microsoft devices will both let you do that. Um, so why do they need two Miracast devices? Why not? Why not? <laughs> I guess, why I don't ask know. why? <laughs> do do they? I mean, are they? They're not functionally identical. Yeah, they are functionally identical. Functionally identical. Okay. Well, the you know, the previous one has an NFC capability that the current the new one does. But that's just for so, pairing, right? Yep. 
Yeah, makes it just easier. Just the initial. All right. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I think I think what happened was um, just like we saw with those Android X phones, Nokia X phones. I think that that Microsoft, or I should say, Nokia was already on the way to delivering that adapter, and so Microsoft takes them over. They hadn't yet had time to merge their whole peripheral teams, maybe, and that's why so, they. By had the way, I, I am positive you're right, but I will just point this one out, this one yeah. thing out. Um, when they announced that earlier device, they announced four things at the time. Uh, well, five things, I guess. Three Lumia phones, right? Yeah. All branded Nokia. Nokia Lumia 830, uh, 730, 735. They announced a new charging plate, branded Nokia charging plate, whatever the model number is. And then they announced the Microsoft, whatever the heck that thing is, HD10, that thing with the crazy name. So they chose to brand that thing, that one thing, which, I yes, obviously was a Nokia device, as Microsoft. <laughs> so it's like yeah, guys, I know. Yeah. right? Very right. strange. Very yeah. strange. Now the other, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Paul, because I get kind of a conflicted message mm -hmm. on this. Um, why is or isn't this like the Chromecast? Right. So Microsoft didn't want people saying that. Hey, this okay. sixty dollar thing they just came out with is just like the Chromecast. So this is actually my tip for today. So can we just hold oh, off? Okay, until, let's hold I'm off. On that, I will explain that. Oh, good. It's not good, the same good. thing. Because I get a very weird answer when I ask I, I, that question. <laughs> I think, I think um, it's like OneDrive versus OneDrive for business. They're not the same thing. But conceptually, right. they do the same thing. And so yeah. I think they try, you know, even Microsoft is probably, obviously, by making it look the way they look, it looks, they're trying to draw a distinction or a comparison. Um, Roku has a device called the Roku Streaming Stick, which also looks just like that. Um, yeah. That's more like a Chromecast than is this Miracast device, but I'll, I'll get to that uh, during the tip, if, that, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Because I want to make sure we talk about this as much as possible. More, <laughs> even more. Right. <laughs> the show. Is this related to Intel's wireless display? Is that... A... Leo, that's part of the tip. Part of the tip, okay. I know I keep trying to spoil your tip, and I'm sorry. <laughs> it's part I of the tip. say anything more. Wait no more, for the no tip. about dongles. This no dongle dongles. story is moving to the back of the book. It is. <laughs> Where uh, it belongs. Life cycle. Yeah. Take Somebody called the radio station again. I see these radio calls are really good for me because I hear from normal people who don't right. listen to Windows Weekly. They don't read PC Mag. They don't. They you know they got they got nothing. Yep. And they're worried because they knew about the XP expiration. They're saying, "Well, do I have to go to eight? Because isn't seven dying?" Yeah. Oh boy. And I yeah. and I looked it up, and actually, it's it's going out of one form of support pretty soon, but that not extended support, right? I know. Would you explain, Mary Jo, or yes, somebody, I will. anybody? I will. I All will. Right. Okay. Um, so the reason I've been getting a lot of mail about Windows 7 lately is there's a new deadline happening along the very long life cycle of this product. And that deadline is October 31st, 2014. So in about a month. Yeah, That's the one what people that, are seeing and they're freaking. They are. They're freaking. But here's why you shouldn't freak out about it. So on that date, on Octo after October 31st, Microsoft will no longer provide to OEMs certain builds of Windows 7 for them to pre-install on new PCs. Oh. So they're not going to give them plain old Windows 7 Home Basic, Home Premium, or Ultimate. They will keep giving them Windows 7 Professional oh. because they haven't established a date when they're going to not continue to give that to them yet. Okay. okay, so the OEMs can be stockpiling all this stuff. So they can be buying a ton of Windows 7 SKUs right now if they want, putting them on PCs and just stockpiling them in case people want to get more Windows 7 PCs running those SKUs. This date doesn't change anything about the end of life um, in terms of when Microsoft is going to keep supporting the operating system. So free mainstream support for Windows 7 is not uh, going to expire until January 13, 2015. But even after that, until 2020, Microsoft's going to keep giving us patches and fixes for Windows 7. So you don't have to freak out. We're going to keep getting Windows 7 patched, updated, and you can keep using it with no worries whatsoever until 2020. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that date is something that's kind of triggering a lot of people. And I, that's why I wrote about it this week, because I, ke I kept getting mail saying, I heard Microsoft's not going to sell Windows 7 anymore after that date. That's correct for most of the SKUs, but it doesn't really affect most people. 
I mean, if you want to get go out and get a PC with Windows 7, you're still going to be able to find them for quite a while. Uh, even those certain SKUs I mentioned, the Home Basic, Premium, and uh, Ultimate, because a lot of these OEMs are stockpiling them. So don't worry. Nobody panic. That makes sense. I mean, I'm yeah. actually, frankly, surprised they're still selling Windows 7. So that's... Yeah. So, uh, yeah. and you could still get a copy of Windows 7, just not, the, not those particular versions, not the Home... Yeah. And the basic, you know, honestly, if you're using Windows 7, um, Microsoft am. has not updated that operating system in uh, about three years. Well, you can, but you, <laughs> so right, but nothing you, is going to change. You know, I mean, you're going to yeah. get Windows updates, but that's the concern. Yeah. Like, that's the problem. People conflate the notion of window of of security patches yes. with mm -hmm. updates. No, no, that, that you're going to be getting those for years and years. <laughs> and yeah. that's what I told yeah. her. So I'm glad. Yeah. I said, in fact, I said, I think exactly that. Oh no, you're going to be getting those for years and years. Yeah. No, yeah. No, no. No. You will get the same lackluster level of support you've been getting from Microsoft <laughs> for the past three years. Nothing's changing. <laughs> no, but people are people because of the XP and all the attention we paid to it. People yeah. want to know. Well, when is that happening? But XP came out in 2001. Yeah, it's not for a I long know. time. I mean, I Windows 9, or uh, Windows 7 dates back to what, but 2009? They see, but then they see these bulletins, and, you know, uh, link bait is really the problem. People publish link sure. bait articles. Yep. Windows is expiring. Right. End of life. End it's of a life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that's going on that's making people freak out is they're still worried because a lot of them are like, yeah, what, you know, I don't like Windows 8. I don't, I don't like what it looks like. I don't want to retrain. And... Sure. Man, I don't know what threshold's going to be or even when that is. They don't even do any homework, right? They right. just are like, I want Windows 7. I don't want anything else. So they're they're just in panic mode, basically. I want right. Windows 7 and I want an iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> and that's <laughs> and all. And then I'm done. Yeah. That's all I want. <laughs> Leave yeah. me alone. Yeah. 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 Okay. So nothing to worry. Nothing to see right. here. Don't Move panic. along. Move Nobody along. panic. Uh, let's talk about layoffs. I, I, don't, I hate to, but... Uh, I know. Yeah. The round well, two. We, I know. Just la last week on Windows Weekly was the day before uh, round two was going to happen. Right. So we were saying, yeah, we both heard round two is coming and it's tomorrow. Right. Uh, so it was. And they Microsoft laid off another 2,100 people last week. So that, that was part of the original group of 18,000 that they announced they were going to lay off back in July. Um so right now they've they, the first round was like thirteen thousand. This was twenty one hundred people. So there's still thousands more to come, but this this round also like the first round hit all the different divisions across the company. I heard from people in in legal and corporate affairs and um, office, Bing. You know, different people got cut from different teams. Uh, the two biggest public cuts that we knew of. Uh, were affecting one was one was Microsoft closed Microsoft Research in Silicon Valley, one of their research labs. That was fifty people that they ended up cutting. Um, some of those people are going to get reassigned to other places, but most of those people are end, ended up going. And it doesn't mean Microsoft's pulling out of Silicon Valley. Another clickbait headline I saw quite a bit last week. Uh, <laughs> not to accuse anybody of anything. No, let's not. Um, <laughs> they, there's, they, they still have thousands of people who work in Silicon Valley, but this is just the Microsoft Research Silicon Valley facility that is closing. Um, and the other one that, that they announced was uh, affected by the layoff. Well, they didn't actually announce it. The people who were laid off announced it for them. Uh, they took the trustworthy computing team at Microsoft and they split that in half. So some of those people now are going to go to the cloud and enterprise division. Some are going to go to... Uh, legal and corporate affairs, because those are the people who work on policy. And then there were some number of people in trustworthy computing that got completely cut. And we don't know how many people that was, but um, we've heard from a few people who got cut uh, or are being affected by the by the layoff in that group. I also saw some reports, Microsoft Research Robotics team uh, got cut in part, if not in total, and again, it's one of those things. I don't know how many people were actually left on that team because they had pretty much uh, taken yeah. the axe to the standalone robotics program a while ago, um, even though they still had a couple lingering projects. Instead, Did anyone write the headline, uh, Microsoft seeds robotics market to Google? <laughs> no, because, you know, what Someone they did was they took... It's all yours, you know, Google. 
I know. Now they have took, fun with they, Skynet, jerks. <laughs> right now, they Microsoft have been putting some of their robotics team members in into other projects. Like like some of those people were in Connect, right? So the standalone research team that was doing robotics is the one that got the cuts. Not and it wasn't like, hey, let everybody who's working on robotics at Microsoft, let's cut all those people. That it wasn't that either. Um, so yeah, th that's what we know about what happened last week so far. Um, and okay. yeah, we know there's more rounds coming. We don't know when, but uh, Microsoft did say in July that they'd have they'd be cutting all 18,000 within one year, with most of those cuts happening in the six months starting in July. Wow. Yeah. Right, which maps to their fiscal year as well. It does. Ah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So not a, not a fun story, but there yeah. you have it. it. I mean, not as epically horrible as the last one, obviously. No. Um, and not something new. I mean, this, like she said, this is, uh, they announced they were doing this previously. There'll be more, but, you know, the, the first one was a huge one. These subsequent ones will be smaller. Okay. Yep. We're going to take a break, come back, more to come. Paul Therott, Mary Jo Foley, and uh, a little bit more about the new Office 16, Xbox One, and, of course, the back of the book where Paul will finally explain... DLNA <laughs> and Intel well, wireless display. <laughs> Finally! It's like I'm going to explain God. <laughs> <laughs> Our show today brought to you by Lynda.com. You want an explanation? Oh, man, can Linda give it to you? Linda's got now, I think, like um, 4,000, something like that. I, actually, we can go look. Courses online in every area, not just of technology, but of business. It is a great place to learn. And I think we're all realizing now that the web has become the world's classroom. Lynda.com has been doing it almost longer than anybody. L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash windows, if you want to know more. Whether you're a beginner or advanced, Lynda's got courses for you in every aspect of technology, including Windows 8.1 Tips and Tricks, QuickBooks Pro 2014 Essential Training, Windows 8.1 Essential Training. If you want to be a developer or you are a developer, they've got 355 courses there. In Design, 498. Web Design, 545. Photography, 459. A total, let me see what the count is. Two thousand. They're almost at 3,000. 2,962 courses. And each course is divided up in sections so you can learn what you want, when you want. Find them easily using their transcriptions. So you just search the transcript, find what you want, and jump to that port, a part of the uh, class. You learn at your own pace from start to finish or just the quick answer. Tools include, besides the searchable transcripts, playlists, and certificates, certificates of course completion. By the way, you could publish those in your LinkedIn profile, which is great if you're a professional and you want to show what you know. Uh, premium members with an annual plan can download courses to their iPhone, their iPads, their Android devices, watch them offline. You can also download project files and practice along with the instructor. Starting price, $25 a month. And you get unlimited access. That's not per course. That's total. And the pros who are teaching these are so good. People like my buddy, Bert Monroy. In fact, I know a lot of the teachers here, including Linda. I've known for years. LoveLinda.com. I'm going to log into my, let me just log into my Linda account real quickly here. I can show you some of the courses I've been taking. I really love lynda.com, and it's the place I go when I want to polish up my skills. They've got courses in every subject. Here, I'm going to log in, and there. Um, and we've got a special deal, of course. Wouldn't be wouldn't be Linda without a special deal for our listeners. Um Right now, if you use the offer code WINDOWS at lynda.com slash windows, you're going to get access for free for seven whole days. Seven days and the run of the place. They do have free featured courses, by the way. Right now it's travel photography, which is kind of timely. 22 videos, an hour and 55 minutes. I got three days I can watch it for free just before my trip to London. That's awesome. Photoshop Elements Essential Training, Executive Leadership Fundamentals, Storytelling for Designers, Bin Building a Responsive Page on Your Website, Sheet Metal Design with Inventor. I don't even know what that is, but I know it's good because it's at Lynda. Lynda.com slash Windows to find out more. View the uh, various courses they've got. 
You've got a week to take any course you want from beginning to end, or all of them. I don't know how much you can cram into a week. LYNDA.com slash Windows for that seven-day trial. We thank Linda for uh, her support of Windows Weekly. Paul Therott, Mary Jo Foley, Windows Weekly. Moving on, let's talk about Office 16. Sweet 16. Mm -hmm. What do we know? You know, I, I was thinking this the other day. It's surprising we don't know more about Office yep. 16 at this point than we do. Because um, Office 16, 16 is the code name. It's yeah. the next version of Office, yeah. right? Yeah. Let The one that was 2013 was called Office 15. And um, we're, we're just starting to see the very first leaks about features for Office 16. So uh, Tom Warren over at The Verge got a couple screenshots from what we think is the Office 16 technical preview, the internal preview that um, Microsoft's dog fooding itself and a couple people, well, I shouldn't say a couple, a few uh, choice partners and customers may have as well. And right now it looks like it's a very incremental release, which isn't that surprising because that's <laughs> kind of, it, Office kind of has everything, right? And it's like, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I didn't write about this because I compared the, <laughs> ribbons and these apps to the ones that yeah. are there today and there's they're the same like looks the same <laughs> yeah they're, they're gonna add supposedly this tell me tool that they have which uh they have it right now in office online and they also have it in office for ipad where you can type into a search box tell me how to um bold the text in this blah 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 instead of trying to kind of uh search through the ribbon and find the right command so that'll be good if they add that uh, and they also said there's going to be a new black theme for the Office uh, 16. So you'll have gray, so dark gray, from, and white. And now you're going to have black. I think it was but you know what's 2010 funny? 2010 was the last one that had like the really dark theme. Yep. And remember and during the beta it, right? for 2013, the darkest yep. theme was actually super light. So people yeah. complained, and then they added a slightly yep. less light theme, which is still really light. It is. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. People are saying so. black in quotes because it's not like what you what we're. No, thinking it's dark gray. It's what black. It's just yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then the other things we've heard leaks about. Um, they're again very incremental. At least the parts we're hearing right now. Things like they're doing some stuff around the Excel data model that um, will make it easier for people who want to use things like the Power Pivot from Power BI. Um, that they're also going to make it work better on small footprint devices. Um, so, uh, again, all very small tidbits that, that we're hearing at this point. Now, uh, we don't really know when we're going to see this. Um, the rumors I had heard before this past week was uh, Microsoft probably would have some kind of a public beta of this version of Office for Windows out in the fall of 2014, so maybe around October. And it would be all the apps. So it would be Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, Outlook, Visio, Publisher, the whole thing. Uh, this is not the same thing that we've been talking about that's codenamed Gemini. This is this is not the touch first office. This is just the plain old office client for Windows. And if they stick to that time frame that we had heard a while back, I think the idea is that this new version of Office, Office 16, would be out in the spring of 2015, along with everything else that we keep talking about, right? So Threshold will be out then, and also the touch first office, codename Gemini, and this, all spring 2015, if if that timeline is still in place. The one thing I still don't know, and I don't know if Paul's heard anything on this, off the next office for Mac? I was going to ask you, because no I'm idea. forever. <laughs> and I, this is so overdue, and I hope I that... Because we're already a year, they, we're already behind a version anyway. Way behind, right. way yeah. behind. So I, I it, Microsoft this year released a version of OneNote for the Mac. And if you look at that, it's beautiful, it's clean, it looks, you know, it's got a nice ribbon UI. If you compare that to Mac 2011, which is the current version, Office 2011, sorry, on the Mac, um, night and day. You know, the, the yeah. Office Mac looks horrible, I think, you know, personally. So I'm hoping they at least restyle it to have that kind of look and feel and, uh, and you know, make it as functionally uh, close to Windows as possible. But I haven't heard anything about that. No. There was there were rumors Office for Mac might be out this year. But in the past, what they do is they yeah. do a version of Office for Windows. Then the, five or six months later, out comes the next version yeah, of Office for did, Mac. But they didn't do it the no, last time. But it's time. been a year and no. a half since the last version. On the other hand, yep. as you pointed out, Office doesn't, doesn't really need to change. I mean, it's uh, there's nothing no. on the Mac 
version that's yeah. completely missing, I guess, tell me or whatever, but. Um, yeah, but you know what? I, I When you want people in your ecosystem, yeah, uh, yeah. Mac yeah. users all have iPhones you and iPads. like second class, isn't it? Uh, yeah, you got to, they've just released a really high uh, quality office for iPad. It's but beautiful. Maybe what I'm thinking uh, they, they in their minds, hey, we did this. No, yeah. but you got to do both. You can't. Yeah. The, the the way this they don't they still don't have one drive for business on the Mac you know, I know. they need to really figure that out and by the way that, yeah. it's it's worse than that though because um, one drive for business on the PC and one drive consumer on the Mac one drive consumer for Windows Seven I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything here are all broken they're all horribly broken and what I mean by that is in Windows Eight you get this beautiful integration with one drive consumer where you can arbitrarily mark items to be available offline or not. It's really nice. In those other apps, you have to up front say, this is what I want available offline. And you can change it, but you can't see the other stuff. You can't go into the file system and see the offline stuff. And it's just, uh, it's all or nothing in the case of OneDrive for Business on the PC and on the Mac, they don't even have that option. So this is one of those things that they, they need to, fix this, you know, so that it works yeah. uh, consistently across all the platforms. Mm. They did They did say publicly the OneDrive for Business for Mac would be out in calendar 2014. They have said okay. that. But that could just be because SharePoint and SharePoint Online is being revved in 2014. And it doesn't necessarily mean that's because when there's a new version of Office for Mac. Mm. Um, I, I don't so follow yeah. the Mac stuff as closely as I do iOS, but I, it's possible yeah. that there are APIs available in the, uh, what's it called, Yosemite, the new version that mm -hmm. enable this stuff to work more seamlessly with the OS and the file system. Yeah. And maybe they're waiting on that. I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea. I, I just haven't heard anything, but. No. God, I, I and the I one thing I, you know, it's interesting that the team that builds Office for Mac is the same team that built Office for iPad. Um, yeah. So it's not the same team that builds Office for Windows. So, you know, in theory, you could say, hey, that team could already be well along with a new version of Office for Mac. And yeah, they're, that they're on a separate timeline. But I don't know. Uh, we keep asking. We keep getting no comment. Right. So I don't know. No word. So you saw that Ray Ozzy is up to something. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He did, um, just, he worked at Microsoft, of course, uh, for a few years and did Groove, oh, did he? right? Yeah. What, did he, what did he do? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, I asked that actually, and somebody reminded me about he Groove. was the chief uh, um, software architect. So uh, for, uh, Ray's very famous in computing because he worked at Lotus and, and later IBM yep. and worked in, and invented a group, you know, really groupware with Lotus Notes and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I guess Groove was designed to be a groupware solution. Is that still around? What happened to that? Yeah, uh, we use it's, it. It's part of Office. SharePoint and okay. yeah, it's it's actually. OneDrive for Business. Uh, OneDrive for Business. Yeah, I was gonna say it's essentially OneDrive for oh, Business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. It used to be called like the SharePoint client, you know, some point or whatever that mm -hmm. was. Uh, mm -hmm. Groove before that. His, but, his yeah. new thing is uh, iPhone only right now. It's uh, called Taco, and the nope. it's it's poorly named. <laughs> no, it's not called Taco. It's poorly it's named. It's called <laughs> Taco. It is terribly named. It, well, it sounds like Taco. It does. It's Talco. Yeah. T a l k o. And it's, uh, I've tried it. It lets you make phone calls, but also audio messages. It's like a multimedia group calling experience. It's not so far different from WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger yeah. or a lot of other programs. It's, um, uh, you know, obviously so when you're engaged in a phone call, you're kind of engaged, right? You're there doing stuff. But it, my take on this is that it's meant to be, you kind of come in and out of it. Yeah, you know, that you exactly. Can, it's, uh, and if for a group, it would be good. Yeah. I, well, I don't know if it'd be good. It, it's good. Especially if you like tacos. <laughs> Who doesn't love tacos? <laughs> Taco know. Tuesday. They did release it on a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> it's ta Taco Tuesday. <laughs> it's Taco Tuesday. <laughs> it's Taco Tuesday. It's Taco yeah. Tuesday. I can't. I don't feel comfortable making that a software pick of the week for a variety of reasons. But well, it's an iPhone only for one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to make anybody happy if you do it. I, but I, ha I have played with it. And, it, you know, it's Ray. I think probably he's, you know, emeritus. He's the elder statesman of the company. And somebody said, hey, Ray. But I Wasn't, don't know. Uh, was it Mitch Kapoor who was working on a, like, an idea processor outlook replacement thing for some time? Does that sound familiar? 
It wasn't. In the past it, it was. It was called um, Evolution, was it? I can't remember. Yeah. It was a big open like source I, project, and it kind of flopped. It just went yeah, absolutely nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, I think a lot of these guys who've been around for a long time, um, you know, they... You know, you're not dead. You want to do stuff. You know, it's a must. Right. I, I understand it. I'm not it. dead. I, I want to do stuff. Ray's probably yeah. close to my age. Sure. I don't know. You I, know, I remember when when Ray Ozzie came to Microsoft and, and we heard him give his first few keynotes and, and he talked about some of the stuff he was working on. I remember none of us understood anything he was working on. <laughs> We'd all just kind of sit right. there and go. He's a visionary. What? <laughs> visionary. Yeah, no, he but, was. Yeah. But so just check. He, he, Go ahead. He he, but I, I was going to say he also he was very um, prescient in what he told right. Microsoft oh, they needed uh, yes. to do. No, that's right. He wrote oh, the I've internet the story. The cloud. Ray Ozzy was right. Yes, he exactly. understood the cloud. He was right. Uh, and told yeah. the mobile first cloud for us, or devices and services. Yeah. That was him right. ten years ago. I know. So my, my point was going to be, I don't understand Taco that well either or why I would ever want that. The because 10 years also from now, not, we're all going to be using it. <laughs> I know. We're going to all be like, you know what? He was right. Uh, I, I You know, I think it's also hard for me yeah. because I'm not really a collaborative person. I work by yeah. myself. It, and it, I, Me too. So it's hard to envision it. it, would, it would by be the way, a I, team. Uh, that's, that's an interesting point. Uh, a lot of the – Microsoft is often talking about the ability to, uh, you know, co-edit a document at the same time. Right. Or they, they always have these scenarios. And I'm always like – yeah, I, you know what? Does that? I don't ever need to do that. And even, <laughs> even when I've written a book with somebody, that doesn't really come up all that much. You know, like mm -hmm. I really don't. I would find that kind of awkward, right? Yeah. But uh, you know, when Microsoft uh, embraces the Taco First strategy in ten years, <laughs> we're going to look back <laughs> and say, you know, Ray Ozzy did it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, he is an old man. He's one year older than me, exactly. So, 50, 58 years old. That's so, of course, he's not retiring. That is not, that is not old. I know. That's it's what I'm saying. Old. It's not he, old. He has a lot more things to invent out there. <laughs> so, I take it back. Um, Xbox One launching in China. No. Hey, Ray. Oh, wait. Wait. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, so, uh, I don't remember the numbers anymore, but Microsoft was launching in numerous new markets throughout the course of September. One of the big ones, the big one. Uh, it was going to be Xbox, I'm sorry, it was going to be China on Tuesday. And then I think late Friday night, they said, eh, it's going to be late in New Year. Sorry about that. And sure enough, China, just messing with them again, you know, because <laughs> um, yeah, that's what they do these days. It's like, oh, you an American software company? Hold on, let me get the knife. And they just kind of throw it into your uh, liver there. So I, would, I'm at, I have to say, uh, uh, just a few days later, they came out and said, okay, we're going to launch next, actually, I think it's Monday, if I'm not mistaken, but next week sometime. And um, I really, honestly, when they delayed this thing, I thought it would be November, December. I thought it was going to be a long time. I'm really surprised it came together that quickly. And so I think the nice thing for Microsoft here, hopefully, is that they're still going to launch ahead of PlayStation. They're not going to launch with as much China market content as they were hoping to have. They've been talking up... Uh, Chinese uh, specific games and apps, you know, entertainment services and so forth. They were obviously working with a lot of third parties on that stuff. And I guess not as much of it is available as they were hoping, but next week is the week. So I, I don't was, know. Was I just feel like with the Xbox. I, I was going to say, was that delay connected to the antitrust case against them in China or no? I mean, that's the know. speculation. I mean, I, I bet it was. Yeah. I mean, look at uh, yeah. Apple. Apple thought yeah. it would get the iPhones out in China now, but. Yeah. Uh, you know, day and day, but they couldn't. It, it, it's hard to do stuff in China. Yeah. yeah. Ch China it's, it's invented like bureaucracy. With the mafia down on the docks. Yeah. You know, you got to do things a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, Confucianism is essentially bureaucracy codified. <laughs> okay. But, I, I, right. <laughs> well, but no, it is. Just, that is. I'm not. No, no, I, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying, you know, I, I think of China as more of a controlled commercialism you know that right. they have a if you think the separation between the rich and the poor is terrible in the united states right. uh, you know check out china well take and a bureaucratic I, regime add corruption add yeah. xenophobia on top right. of it's, that by the way it's the mafia and, and, <laughs> that, that's yeah, what i just yeah. exactly i right. mean it's it's right. china is amazing yeah. so um, this is the first time anyone's been able to launch a video game console in this country in over 14 years and there's special games oh yeah they're not. It's not the same games you and I have. That's what I mean. 
Yeah, Mr. So one Mao of the games goes must to be town. like help you know prop know. up the Chinese firewall to keep up the <laughs> international doubles. Yeah. One of the games as you're playing it, you're going through Google search terms and eliminating yeah. the bad ones. Exactly. That's the game. Exactly. <laughs> right. Get rid of those imperialist dogs. <laughs> I, I would actually I, I would love to see the games that they're releasing on the on the on the Chinese version of this. I mean I wonder what they are. I mean maybe they're just not as violent or sexy. I don't know. Right. I mean let's face it. Some of our games are a little too violent and sexy. Maybe you I should never get be the too, Chinese too sexy, Leo. But uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, see what I'm saying. <laughs> see where I'm going with it. I see how that might be a problem for some people. <laughs> if you're really clever. Mm -hmm. You would create a game that would somehow help you hack the West. You know, it would be like couched in some sort of game thing. Well, I am absolutely positive that that is one of the number one entertainment choices in China right now. <laughs> hack the hack West. Hack the West. Yeah. It's a new game. We're going to take a <laughs> whack and open port. We're yeah. going uh, to take a break. When we come back to the back of the book, Paul will finally explain. <laughs> what Miracast, I'm getting Chromecast, nervous now. Airplay, DNLA, Why Die, what they have in common. Okay. What they don't. Intel tells me you should never call it Why Die. And I know why. <laughs> exactly. They don't want it to die. Uh, well, it's already dead. So. Yeah, so didn't work. It did it, Intel. Should have gone with my plan. Our show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, ZipRecruiter can make it a lot easier if you're uh, the person in charge of uh, recruitment at your company, you know it's a very challenging uh, world. I mean, the Internet has made it easier. I mean, in the sense that there are now, you know, hundreds of places you can you can post your job listing. But which one's the right one? And how do you collate the results? And on and on and on. ZipRecruiter is the one place to go. You'll post to ZipRecruiter. It goes to 50-plus job boards and social networks like Twitter and Facebook. Craigslist, LinkedIn. It is so awesome. We used it, and I couldn't believe how effective and fast it was. You'll find candidates in any city, any industry, nationwide. You post once, and you just watch those qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. That's important, too. Posting your job to one place, then they come in. They You can rank them, rate them. You don't have to juggle emails or calls to your office. You screen, screen the candidates right in the ZipRecruiter interface. You hire the right person fast. No wonder a quarter million businesses have used ZipRecruiter, including us. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for a free four-day trial. Absolutely free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows. ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows. This is, you know, it's, it's a second-stage Internet company. You know, the first thing that happens is the Internet's created, and all these people, you know, create job boards, you know, monster and everybody. And then the second order of problems occurs. Well, now we have so many job boards. How do we organize it? Where do we go? ZipRecruiter solves that. So great. ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows. 50 plus job boards with one click. Hire fast. Hire the right person at ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows. We thank them so much for their support of Windows Weekly. Paul Therott, back of the book time. What's up? Oh, wait a minute. I got to Leo. turn you on there. Yes. You're welcome. Back when Leo and I started doing Windows Weekly. <laughs> Way back when. There was a little technology called Windows Vista. Oh, yeah. And back in those days, uh, when you know b the big news in, in the kind of, uh, in what we now think of as like the Internet of Things, you know, the yeah. devices connecting to devices, uh, in the open standards world was something called universal plug and play. Right. UPnP. And on the Apple side. Yes. Yeah. And we on had the, and, and also, Rendezvous. Uh, right. I was going to say, on the Apple side, they had Rendezvous. Yeah. And Rendezvous became Bonjour. Yes. And, um, because I hated Rendezvous wasn't this hard, kind of hard enough to pronounce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it wasn't French enough. Yeah. Um, and so, in those days, I was firmly in the camp of the Microsoft way of doing things, right? Well, but it wasn't the, all the based was, on zero config, which was a Microsoft yeah, open technology. standards. Yeah. Is, these were yeah. standards. You know, yeah. the, the idea was one that makes sense in a world in which you're partnering with all kinds of companies to provide the various pieces of the puzzle. You've got the chipset makers that have to put the hardware into your computers. You've got the, you know, the wireless manufacturers that are going to make making the routers and all that kind of stuff. And then you have like the devices on the other side of the chain and you want to connect to devices. You know, in the old fashioned, in the old days, we'd plug a cable into a printer or something. And, you know, going forward, we want to connect to those things 
over uh, a local network and then eventually over the internet. And that's kind of how this stuff evolved. But um, what has happened in the real world is that, as it turns out, when you create a proprietary technology that only works with your stuff, guess what? It works really, really well, <laughs> you know? And so uh, the Apple stuff kind of evolved into what they now call AirPlay. And uh, AirPlay is, does all kinds of things. But one of the things that AirPlay does is allow you to walk into a room with a, uh, an iPod Touch or an iPhone or an iPad. And if you have an Apple TV connected to your HD TV, you can play content from that device to the TV. But you can also now, uh, in more recent versions, duplicate the screen if you want to. So you can actually see your iPhone screen you know, up on your HD TV. Um, and I, in fact, just last night I was doing this with... Uh, uh, the iPhone 6 Plus, which supports um, like a landscape mode on yeah. the home screen. is cool. You know, yeah. it actually works. Okay. So that's cool. Uh, AirPlay works great. This is one problem with AirPlay. It's literally Apple only. And it literally requires only, there's only one device that supports it that's not an iDevice. It's the Apple TV. And so if you want to get your screen or a movie or whatever it is up on the screen from an Apple device using Apple's technologies, um, you have to use Apple TV. So last year, or the year before, I don't remember when it came out exactly, uh, Google came out with Chromecast. And Chromecast is in many ways, it's, it's funny because it's smart in some ways, but it's also dumb in some ways. It's a dongle. It sits on an HD, HDMI port. Um, it uses USB for power. And if you don't have USB, it includes a, a power adapter so you can plug it into the wall. But hopefully what it does is it sits behind the, uh, the screen of the TV. By itself, it doesn't do anything. It's not like an Apple TV you can use standalone. You don't have to have an iPad or an iPhone or an iPod Touch. The i, uh, sorry, the Apple TV has a remote control. It has its own software, you know, on the device. Connects to online services. If you bought movies or music or TV shows or whatever through the Apple ecosystem, you can access them directly without any other device. It's you know like a Roku or a standalone device. Chromecast is completely different. It relies on you to have a device, typically an Android device, but actually it also works with um, iOS devices too. And if you do something like uh, Google Play, uh, well, whatever the app is called, Google Play Video or whatever the whatever their video app is called, you could rent or buy a TV show or movie. Say, I want to play it on the Chromecast, find your Chromecast on the network, and then it, it, there's like a handoff that occurs. And now the Chromecast is interacting with that movie directly, streaming it from the internet, and you can use your device as a smart remote control of sorts. So these are the two kind of major competitors today. There have been many others. And in the Microsoft you know, realm over the years, we've gone through a variety of things. Uh, we've had uh, like Play2, which is uh, Microsoft's implementation of uh, DLNA, I believe, which is based on UPnP, the thing I was talking about at the beginning, kind of an open standards way of doing things. Mary Jo might remember at the Windows 7 launch in New York, one of the big demos they showed was a single Windows 7 PC transmitting the same video signal. I think it was a movie. Yeah to some crazy number of screens, 13, yep. 27, whatever it was. And yeah, we all more. sort of like, oh, you know, yep. remember? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I do. The all open standards. That stuff, by the way, never works. It never works. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it never works. I think all of so, these are based on open standards, but then they're, yeah. they customize. Oh, the problem, mm -hmm. so the, it, it's just like the PC market. The strength of the system is also the Achilles heel of the system. The weakest component in the chain will always screw you over. And so depending on your router, depending on your PC, the chipset in the PC, depending on the device you're trying to connect to, there's all kinds of pieces that can mess it up. If you think about Apple and their closed system, they know this stuff is always going to work. They make it. They make all of it. And so it's the most reliable. It doesn't always work, by the way. Um, I had rented a movie on my iPad when I went to um, Las Vegas, didn't watch it. My wife and I were going to watch it at home. But once it's on the iPad... You can't start it from an Apple TV or from some other device, but you can use AirPlay to put it on the Apple TV, which is on the TV. That thing hung and froze. Apple TV had a software update it had to install. My wife just got up and said, yeah, let, give me a call when this is done. And she walked away and it took 30 minutes. It literally took 30 minutes. And by the way, that's the best solution there is today. Um, Chromecast is not horrible. The only problem with Chromecast, well, there's two problems. One is it's very specific to Google. It's a Google thing. It's, you know, Microsoft doesn't support it, obviously, in Windows. Um, the thing I don't like about it is that the Chromecast by itself is just a dumb dongle. Um, it doesn't have a remote. And so if, let's say you've triggered a, a TV show to start playing from your phone, and you put your phone down, you're watching it up on the TV. It looks beautiful. The quality is fantastic. 
the doorbell rings or the phone rings, and now you need to pause the TV show. Well, if your phone, the screen is turned off, you got to turn it on, you got to put in your PIN code. Um, hopefully you haven't switched away from that app and you have to find the software control on the screen to hit the pause button. Like there's no dedicated remote for it, which I think is something that might put that solution over the top, by the way. Um, but whatever, it's, it's not terrible. On the Windows side, like I said, we, we've had all these things, DLNA. We've had YDI, Wi-Fi Direct, which is an Intel thing, which is sort of proprietary, basically proprietary. A lot of PC ship with Intel chipsets. You used to see Wi-Fi Direct as a thing. You don't really see that anymore, actually. Microsoft has created its own um, proprietary solutions as well. They have a solution. They have something called Play on Xbox, uh, which appears in, like, say, the Xbox video app in Windows 8. And that's a way to do a more sophisticated thing than just play to or just DLNA or just UNPNP. It's, it's, a, it's, a, more, it's a, a solution sort of like AirPlay where the two apps actually understand each other and work in a more intelligent way. So if you close your, um, if you're doing play to, which is just streaming from a PC to a screen, well, to a device connected to a screen, and you close your laptop or you turn off your tablet, the stream goes off. That's how it works. It's dumb. You know, it's, that's the problem. So play on Xbox Actually, the playback is handed off to the Xbox. The Xbox plays the content. It requires Xbox, you know, video content, obviously. It can't be your own content. And then you can use the Xbox controller as a remote, or maybe you have an Xbox remote. Obviously, you could use that as a remote. But now it's 2014, and so now we have something called Miracast. And Miracast is, again, based on standards. It's sort of uh, what we might call the modern take on DLNA slash Play2 slash uh, Wi-Fi Direct. It's the open standard approach to doing this. But the, the, the important thing to remember about Miracast is that Miracast is the dumbest of all of these things. It is literally, well, it's not literally, but it, it is a wireless wire. In other words, if you have an HDMI cable and you plug it into your computer and you plug the other end into your HDTV, you can do everything you can do with an external display on a computer. You can mirror your screen. You can extend the desktop. You can just use the other screen. You have those are the choices. You know, if you do like Windows key P and Windows 8, you can see the project choices you get up on the screen. Those are the choices you get on HDMI. Those are also the choices you get with Miracast. But Miracast requires all kinds of things. It requires your device to be compatible. Your PC or device, your tablet, your phone, right? It's not every single one of those things. It requires something on the other end of the TV. I mean, maybe someday. There'll be Miracast-enabled TVs. I don't think there are any now. It doesn't really matter. But you have to buy a third-party device. You can buy one of these Microsoft devices. You, it, you can plug it in just like you plug in a Chromecast, just like you plug in an Apple TV, just like you would plug in some WD device, whatever. There's all kinds of things you can plug into your TV. But if you plug in a Miracast device, whether it's that Chromecast-looking dongle or the HD10 thing they announced a month ago or a Netgear device or whatever it is, you can make that connection. You can extend your desktop, um, you can mirror your desktop, and you can do things like play content on the big screen. And so, for example, one of the things I did in Spain was I took a bunch of these little devices with me to test them. I took a Miracast device, I took a Chromecast device. So from a Surface Pro 3, I can Surface Pro 3 is compatible with Miracast, connect to the Miracast, extend the desktop, play the video on, on the second desktop, I guess, which is the big screen. Um, the, the problem with the solution is that... Um, the same as the problem with DLNA and Play2 and all that stuff, is it's dumb. And so if you close the tablet, close the laptop, the video stops. It requires your computer to be on and, and streaming to that thing because that's still the source of the information. Um, the other problem with it is if you have a touch device is if you're playing content from a like a tablet where it's Windows 8, um, the natural choice would be to say, well, I've got this movie playing on this big screen. I don't want the movie to be playing on the small screen too. That's weird, right? You don't want them both doing the same thing because you're sitting in there in a room in the dark, probably watching TV. So I will just use the external display because I only want the video on that one screen. And that makes sense for playback. But if you don't have a keyboard or a mouse, interacting with the controls in the screen gets really weird because the phone rings, the doorbell rings, whatever it is, now you get to pause the movie. How do you do it? Well, you swipe the screen on your tablet but the interface you're looking at is up there on the screen. And so you're making the swipe gestures. You're trying to, you're kind of tapping on the screen where you think it's, you know, on the big screen. It's really goofy. Um, the other problem with Miracast is like everything else I just described that's PC-based is it's really unreliable. It doesn't work very well. 
And uh, Microsoft tells me that their stuff is great. It has low latency. It's supposed to be super reliable. I'm eager to take them up on their, on that and find out if that's true. I will do that. But my experience with Miracast um, has been very, 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 very <laughs> how, negative. How negative? Very, very negative. I, very. I was just thinking that. Everything I've seen on it. Twitter... Every single time I see someone talking about Miracast and Windows on Twitter, it's that it's not working. I've never seen anyone say, wow, this Miracast thing yeah. is awesome. It, it's like it everything <laughs> going back in time to whenever. It, it, you, yeah. you see it, you think, wow, this is great. The theory is wonderful. The reality is terrible. And I can tell you in Spain, mm -hmm. by the end of the trip, trying to watch IT cry with the kids, this is what we do. Plug in an HDMI cable and guess what? It just works every single time. <laughs> the HDMI cable always works. People don't want to string a wire across their living room. I get it, um, which is why we want Miracast or whatever. But uh, anyway, it's not the same as Chromecast or Apple TV. Or, I'm sorry, or AirPlay because Miracast is dumb. It's just it's super dumb. It's just a wireless wire. That's the way to think of it. There's no smarts. <laughs> like, it's just, a wireless it's dumb. wire. <laughs> yep. So like I'm sorry that was super long, but I'll try to write this up in some way that. Maybe makes sense. I don't know. Anyway, so Microsoft's got two of these things coming out. Yeah. So, you know. And are you not recommending them? Is that my, the gist? I have not tried this? them. So I, I will try them. You know, I Raphael Rivera, my uh, co author, obviously, in, this, in the Windows book, uh, probably knows more about Miracast than anyone in the world. He's tested a bunch of these devices. He's going to actually get a great site up about it. And uh, we'll both be looking at these things. But, you know, uh, he'll, he can tell you. I mean, yeah. Miracast is. A great theory, and it's a terrible reality. Wow. Yeah. So far, I mean, it could change. Yeah. And I think this is why Google has customized Dial and DLNA to create the Chromecast with its own proprietary yeah. layer. Why Apple does the same with DLNA and AirPlay is they don't work very well. The open standards don't work very well, and so yeah. all these companies feel like, well, if we're going to give you a Chromecast, good experience. Um, I, I wish Chromecast was a little more widespread. I mean, actually, I love it. you you, you I can love it. Uh, you can cast from Chrome the browser. Chrome, yeah, you can cast so you, a tab. You can do that. Yeah, um, it's you know, opening uh, bit it, by it, bit. It really is, and there's more. And yeah, more if apps you're all if you yeah, if you, if it works out that you have something that makes you know that you can send from Chromecast is actually really nice. It's nice. It, it works well. Yeah, it, it's just that remote issue. Um, you know, the nice thing about the Apple TV is you can, because you're not really casting from a device to the Apple TV when you use AirPlay, but if you kind of think of it that way, once you've triggered the playback of content from an iPad or whatever to Apple TV, you can continue using the Apple TV remote right, to control the playback, right. um, which is wonderful, you know, and that's a much better solution. But of course, the Apple TV is $99 and a Chromecast is what, $29 or $39? Yeah, 35 yeah. So. I mean, uh, you know, and the Chromecast, you use your device as a remote. But what's interesting about the Chromecast is there is a handoff. The Chromecast is the thing yes. like the Apple TV but, that's Which is what makes me wonder why they don't even like sell a $5 remote or a $10 yeah, remote. Could. Like a Chromecast remote, then maybe they will. That would put that over the top in many ways. Really? I think, I think so. I mean, the point is I that do, you yeah. still can use your device and go and everything. But if you go back right. to Right. Uh, so I'm sorry. I, the one thing I didn't get into, uh, Microsoft also, there's also the notion of a second screen Right. kind of scenario, right? right? We know that Microsoft is smart class. Um, smart class works with play on Xbox, by the way, to to do this kind of second screen thing. On the Apple devices, um, I'm actually not super familiar with it, but I think they do have a, I do think there's, I'm not 100% sure about that. I know Amazon does it. Uh, Chrome does it because the your device acts as a smart remote. So actually in that sense, the Apple device does work as a smart remote. So you can use, you could use your Apple device as a remote with Apple TV over AirPlay as well. Um, ultimately, that's kind of the missing piece on Miracast because like I said, it's just a dumb, it's a dumb wire. So you still, you have to tap keys on your keyboard to tap your screen and you're, you know, it's dumb. Yeah. We'll get better someday. I don't know. I don't Miracast know. 2, not. the quickening. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe we won't. Maybe this is it. This is as good as it gets. Uh, software pick of the week. You have some several. Yeah, I'll spend forty-seven minutes on this one as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> this <laughs> no. Uh, be, uh, I, where was I when I found this? I might have actually still been in Spain. Um, there's a game that I think it came out on iOS first. It's called Valiant Hearts: The Great War, and uh -huh. it's a 
you buy the game, you know, it's uh, inexpensive and it, you get the first episode, then you can buy three more episodes and you can buy a package. So it's very inexpensive to get all three extra episodes. Um, it's sort of like that. I recommended a game a while back called Machinima. Yeah. Which is excellent, Love but it's game. also really no, very difficult. You recommended Machinarium. Oh. Machinarium, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Machinarium, yeah. yeah which I, I love. Like right. Yeah. So this is just like that. It's a puzzle type game. It is much easier. So if you were baffled by the puzzles in that game, you'll find this game to be much easier. It's beautiful. And the music is wonderful. And it's the story of World War II. Uh, sorry, World War I. And which is a story I think a lot of people don't know a lot about. And so there's a lot of little um, historical tidbits spread throughout the game, which I think are really fun and, and obviously educational. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful game. It's really neat. And I don't mean beautiful like it's photographic quality. It's 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 really kind of a cartoon or whatever, but it's uh, it's like a graphic novel, like an animated graphic it novel. Kind of it's thing. a platformer? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a puzzle. You know, it's a platform of puzzle kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, sideways yeah. scrolling. Um, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's just an awesome game. And now it's out on Xbox One. It's on Xbox 360. And it is also available for Windows. And so you can, you know, pick your platform of choice. I think the console would be the ideal way to do this. Uh, it's 15 uh, bucks on the Xbox One. I might get it. Fantastic game. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That looks great. Yeah. It's not, yeah, is it on Windows a, Phone as well? No. No, it's on Xbox One, Xbox 360. <laughs> <laughs> on iOS. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and Windows. It's on Steam, I think. It is on Windows. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe it's not on Steam, but it is on Windows. Valiant it, Hearts, The Great Amazon. War for Xbox One. Now time for Mary Jo Foley and her Enterprise Pick of the Week. Yes, I'm going to sound another alarm about uh -oh. an end of life of a product. Uh -oh. um, Windows Server 2003. Microsoft is going to end support for that, meaning no more patches, no more security fixes, nothing in 293 days. How do I know that? I am on the Microsoft Server and Cloud blog where they have a three-part migration blog post series about what you should be doing if you're among the 30% the thirty of all server customers who are still running Windows Server 2003. Um, They're really ringing the bell early on this one. You know, you still have almost a whole year till support expires. That's going to be on July 14th, 2015. But, you know, migra migrating to a new version of Windows Server from something that's as old as Windows Server 2003, and they're, they're advising you to go to Windows Server 2012 R2 at this point, it's a pretty big upgrade. There's a lot of parts you have to think about, you know, in terms of discovering which of your applications are running on it, um, how you're going to move to the new Active Directory that's part of Windows Server 2012 R2, if you're going to use the new version of System Center along with it to manage your server. Uh, there's just a lot of different things to, to start thinking about now. It's not too early, even though it's a year, almost a year away. So they've got the three-part blog series, which you can find if you go to Microsoft Server and Cloud blog. Just, just search for that and you'll find that blog you'll be able to see the three-part series. They've got a link to their countdown site, just like they've had in the past for things like XP and IE8, um, I think, they or IE6, they had a countdown site as well. And you can go step through it and see the different steps they're recommending you take if you're somebody who needs to move to a more recent version. And Microsoft's not the only one who's doing this. A lot of their partners also have migration seminars and free free tutorials and webinars and all that. But it's just something to kind of get in the forefront of your mind right now. If you still have any Windows Server 2003 anywhere in your shop, you should be thinking about getting off that now. You know, so aren't my we tip. lucky, Paul, that we've got Mary Jo to tell us these things? <laughs> to, to sound alarms. Sound alarms. <laughs> you know, I say that every day of my life. Ring the bell. <laughs> Ring the charm slowly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here for you guys to, to take up those important topics. Ask not. See, my whom. reaction to this story would be something like, people are still using Server 2003. <laughs> yeah, can no, you say, well, we, what if 30%. Yeah, don't 30 fix it. 30% no, of all servers are still I mean, running. Well, it's I, crazy. By the way, the, the sheer number of people that are using XP yeah. should have been all, yeah. Yeah. know about That's, that. Now yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. Codename of the week. Codename of the week is... Um, another in the Dynamics series. Uh, the code name is Electra. 
That is the code name for the next version of Microsoft Dynamics Marketing. And the reason I made it my pick this week is Microsoft went public recently with what they're going to have in the fourth quarter in terms of its, the new CRM release. And we talked about that on Windows Weekly either last week or the week before. That's what's codenamed Vega. And at the same time as Microsoft rolls out that release of Dynamic CRM 2015, they're going to be rolling out the new release of Dynamic CRM Marketing. And the main theme of these Q4 updates to Dynamics are to break down silos between sales and marketing. So the marketing part is what's Electra. The, the sales slash CRM side is what's codenamed Vega. They're using, they're using Constellation code names in that group right now. Uh, so if you are somebody who's thinking about maybe moving to the new version on-prem of Dynamic CRM or using the Dynamic CRM online cloud version, you also want to look at this uh, marketing component as well because Microsoft's whole premise is, hey, you know what? You can't have either of these in a vacuum. You can't have sales without marketing and marketing without sales. Uh, and they're going to be doing a lot of integration with CRM going forward in, between these two modules. So keep keep that in mind when you're hearing about this next release. They're, they're just starting now to uh, roll out the preview guide and the pages about what some of the new features are because this is a very major release, both for marketing and for the CRM products. So keep keep that in mind. Vega and Electra are your Vega friends. Vega and Electra. And yes. don't forget Clytemnestra. <laughs> right. They don't have that code. Not yet. They should. Oh, Not yet. I don't think so. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm Not thinking so we ain't going to see a Clytemnestra anytime Probably soon. Probably not. We might see, though, a Coon and Fluffer. Coon and Fluffer. A Coon and Fluffer. <laughs> what is that? It's a beer. It is. Mary Jo's beer is. pick of the week. Yep. So lately I've been drinking a lot of really um, nice IPAs that are actually fairly low in alcohol. This one, it comes in around four or five from Cunin Brewing. It's called Cunin Fluffer IPA. And what's really interesting about these is they aren't, they don't taste weak and watery. Like when you smell them, you're like, wow, hops. It smells like a regular IPA, full strength, like 7% IPA, but it's only four, four, four or five. And, um, that makes it very sessionable, a word we've used on Windows Weekly before, which means you can drink a few of these without just falling off your bar stool. Uh, and this one this one is from Cunin in Michigan. They, are, they brew some really awesome beers. They do a double rice IPA. They do a bunch of really cool, interesting beers. And this one I just had recently, and I, I thought it was quite good. Quite if you didn't tell me it was only four or five, I would have thought it was like seven or eight. Sessionable beers, you drunks. Very sessionable. It's from Cunin Fluffer. Drink mm -hmm. up. That's an awesome name. Cunin Fluffer. <laughs> yeah, the name is great. I don't know. I don't know. It uh, sounds like something a German would use to yeah. clean their kitchen. I had some Cunin Fluffer. It's the original Swiffer. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. Nice. It's a Cunin Fluffer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this portion. In fact, the entire show of Windows Weekly for our... Uh, uh, week of September 24th. Now, remember, next week we'll be at a new time in a very special episode, the first look at the next version of Windows. Windows Threshold, Mary Jo and Paul are flying all the way out for an hour briefing, and then we'll then drive up, to add to the length of their journey, to the uh, Brick House and do a special show at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern time next Tuesday. That's uh, 2000 UTC. A first look at Windows Threshold. Paul and Mary Jo will brief us after their briefing. Uh, Paul, uh, that'll be hosted by uh, Father Robert Ballasere. I'll be out of the country for a week on vacation. Um, and then, of course, that's uh, normally the Security Now time, and Steve will take your time, Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC for Security Now. That's next week only. Swapping with Security Now, as mm -hmm. they say. Can, can people come in for the show and Always. do they have to do anything All shows are special? open. Email tickets at twit.tv and we'll make sure we have enough chairs for you. But uh, you guys will be out in the big studio, so you'll have lots of room. So if anybody wants to come up for that, always welcome. We always get a pretty good uh, crowd uh, for Paul and Mary Jo. People seem to like you. Yay. This one's kind of impromptu, though. You know, like um, normally we're there for a conference where there are a lot of people. Right. I know, That's this true. Time it's Nobody else will be in town. Yeah. 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 See how that goes. But we shall see. Uh, we do this show with uh, two of the best in the biz. Paul Therat is at the super site for Windows, winsupersite.com. You can find his books at the Windows 8.1, it's windows81book.com. That's the name yes. of the site. 
um, and uh, highly recommended. All of his books uh, really help with Windows Phone, Windows 8.1. You can also find Mary Jo online at allaboutmicrosoft.com. That's the home of her ZDNet blog, which is, ironically, all about Microsoft. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's crap. I don't know if ironically is the you, right word. Yeah, you would think people would notice that. I get I get pitches for things that are so outside of oh, the Microsoft yeah, domain. PR like, people, the people are, yeah. But allaboutmicrosoft.com, really? <laughs> There's a, um, a book... For PR people, I can't remember the name of it, where they, they list all of the people and what they do. And periodically, they'll, you know, some intern, you know, college kid intern will write to me from this publication and say, we'd like to update your entry. And the most recent one was, you do a radio show in Phoenix on KPHX, am I right? Oh, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <Wow>. And uh, <laughs> yes, you are. It's not incorrect, but it's it seems like a just a part of what I do. Yeah, small yeah. part of what I do. So uh, anyway, yeah, don't don't count on PR people to know what you no. do. That's I've learned that in my many years in the business. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Mary Jo. We know what you do, and we are grateful for it. Leo, have a good trip. I'll be yeah, in low no. I, expect, I yeah. expect to see photos on Facebook. You will see many mm -hmm. photos everywhere. I am. Uh, I'm going to bring both the iPhone 6 mm -hmm. and the Moto X, nice. and they're both on T-Mobile, so that's nice because I get free, uh, slow but yeah. free internet. Just, yeah, you won't be able to upload anything, but oh, <laughs> should be. I can download all I want. Really, the, the upload speeds are that bad? Well, I, I found it difficult to impossible to do like posts from that internet connection to Facebook if they were big photos. Okay. Well, you know, I have Wi-Fi. Sure with the, Actually, we have somebody coming by with a MiFi. I'll be able to carry around a MiFi. Yeah, no, I'm curious. I'm curious how that works for you. Well, if it doesn't if it doesn't work out, I'll go to the uh, a three store and a three for thirty pounds has unlimited data card yeah. put in there. I'll lose my phone number, but I'll I'll have data. So we'll figure it out. All right, my friends. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye.